Well, as you walked in, you might have seen some things, of course, a little different. Our room set this morning is meant to be a visual invitation to increase our imagination of the book of Revelation as we enter this text. And I want to highlight, too, maybe you saw on the way in there were some paper and colored pencils. Some of us are visual or kinesthetic learners. I invite you, artist or no, I am no visual artist, but if you learn, listen, engage better with your imagination, feel free. There are papers and colored pencils at any point. If you want to draw what you're hearing and learning, we would love to have you do that as well. And then come show me. Come show me what you create. I would love to see that. So my name is Kathy Haug, and I'm part of the teaching team here at Third Church. And I would be remiss if I did not say happy official fall yesterday, right? First day of fall, everybody. Um, many of us, this might be our favorite season, right? Uh, I was thinking coming in this morning about the book of Revelation more and how we're engaging in different ways with the text. And it made me think about the first time a friend of mine came and shared that they'd read a book that they knew I'd loved a long time. And I realized into the conversation, what they meant is that they had listened to the book on audio tape. Audio tape? Tapes don't exist anymore. On audio book. <laughs> Just dated myself a moment. Um, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's a thing, right? Because there's so many different ways that we can read or take in literature and story, right? So we've got traditional, what we think of as a traditional kind of paper, mass printed book. Uh, we have audio books, e-books, and graphic novels or illustrated, right? So um, I'm curious, just because I'm intrigued by this topic of how we learn and take in content, but if you would say that like a traditional paper book is your favorite of those mediums, give me a quick, let's pull the room. Traditional paper. Okay, who are my e-readers? Who like digital content? Yep, I'm seeing some hands. How about audio? Who loves a good audio book listening to the word? And how about my graphic novels? Who loves like illustration, visuals, pictures? Okay, yeah. Um, what's interesting is I can get kind of snooty about this sometimes. People get a little snooty about this. But really, um, even traditionalists, so to speak, the, the paper book as we think of it is a relatively new thing in human history. Right? If you go furthest back, it's actually the spoken, oral tradition, right? We heard the stories. And after that, actually, there's the record, of course, images appearing on cave walls and bits of bark and then parchment. So really, the graphic novel was probably number two, right? And then we have things like papyrus and writing captured in pages around the Egyptian empire. But you got to go all the way to like 1000 AD to get the printing press, which actually China in 1000 AD, and then it was 500 more years till Gutenberg in the press in Europe, right? So there's all these different ways to take in content and writing and literature and the word. And I love that in Revelation, we're kind of getting in touch with those other ways of engaging, right? Do you remember the opening salvo in Revelation 1 where it said, blessed is the one who reads aloud and those who hear it and those who take to heart what is written in it. And as a reminder, if you came in and heard the word being read, and can I just say what we're all thinking? Like, it's a little awkward, right? We're all like, I'm naughty, I came to church late. They're reading, and I'm jumping in. But we're doing that, friends, because in some future chapters, there's like four chapters of text, and we really do want to honor the word by reading it aloud and letting you all hear it. And so that's the choice we're making in doing that because we really believe what the text says, that we're blessed when we read it. We're blessed when we hear it. And we are blessed as we take it to heart and let it change us. So we're going to be in chapters 4 and 5, um, if you heard the reading as you came in. And I want to do a bit of a recap here, though, about what got us to this moment. So if you see the visual here, Revelation is actually a series of kind of movements 
in the unveiling, in the revealing that John is having and sharing in this letter to the churches. So that first wave, that first kind of loop, um, we've just finished in chapters one, two, three. So John, the revelation begins, and he's asked to write things down, right, a capture. And last week, Clayton took us through chapters two and three, which were seven letters to the churches. And the incense rises up. Bless the Lord. (laughs) So that first loop has kind of happened. And now we're moving into the second wave, which is the scroll, this image in the throne room that we're going to unpack, and the scroll being unsealed. So it's four and five, and then six and seven next week is that kind of second loop in the narrative. And if you remember from last week, or if you flip back or look on your e-device back to the letters, um, Clay reminded us some things about these texts. First of all, these were written to these seven churches, which seven, these are real places, but seven is going to be a common number we see, and it's talking about completeness or fullness. So we can also think of these seven as a collective representation of the church as well. And one like the Son of Man came to John and invites him to write these letters. And each one is revealing something to these communities that Jesus finds to be true of them. And you might recall there's kind of three elements in each of those short letters. The first is an affirmation. It's an encouragement. He's something that he notices or sees about them and he cherishes, right? So he affirms them. And the second thing is there is a correction or a challenge, and he says, and now I hold this against you. If you close read, you might have known only Smyrna didn't get a correction. That's the only letter without one. They were in a real tough spot, suffering deeply, but he didn't have a correction. It's interesting, side fact. But then everyone also has a promise, and it ends with, to those who are victorious, and then it states a promise. And you might also remember there's this beautiful refrain that is in each one too, and it says, to them who have ears to hear, right, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So it's a way of saying, listen, lean in, this matters, right? There is a word for the church from Jesus. And... Clay didn't have time to unpack all of these, but you can see that in each of these seven places, they were wrestling with some various tests of their allegiance and their worship to God. Whether it was tests of their first love that they'd lost, it was tests in the midst of great and profound suffering, the test of truth and would they believe and cling to what was true, Would they be tempted to idolatry as a test of their holiness? Sardis, he says, you look alive, but you're not. The reality is you're dead. Will you believe what is true and accept reality? And in Philadelphia, it's the test of their witness. And in Laodicea, as Clayton took us deeper, it's that test of their commitment. Will they be useful or will they be lukewarm, not hot or cold? Right? And so in the scope of this, there's clearly that battle for their allegiance and ultimately for the worship in the life of these communities. And that question kind of lingers as the letters end. It's not really answered. The question is, will they be victorious? Will they overcome these tests and trials? Whom in the end will they worship? So in those six loops, as we go back into this next wave, the action begins to shift. So we're going to look at chapter four. And if you enjoy reading along, you may, you can listen, you can draw what you're imagining as we go to the next step. So as soon as the letters end, the revelation continues, and it says this from John's perspective. So after I looked... After this I looked, and there before me was an open door. It was standing open, right? A door standing open in heaven. 
And it's interesting because that last letter to Laodicea, do you remember if you were here, there was a moment where it said, I'm standing at the door and I knock, right? And all of a sudden, John is in this moment and there's an open door. And there's a voice, the same voice that was like a trumpet that he heard from chapter one. And the voice says, come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this. And it says at once that John was in the spirit, right? And he's caught up. And then he's in a new scene, right? He's come from the earthly realm, that letter writing, those churches, and he's caught up and now he's in the heavenlies. And the first thing that captivates his gaze and attention is the throne. Look at verse two. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it, someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had an appearance of one like Jasper and Carnelian and a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. And surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. Can you start to visualize this? 24 other thrones. And on those thrones were these elders. And it tells us the elders were clothed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. And then these sounds break into the scene he's describing. And it says, from the throne, all of a sudden, now there is these sounds. There's flashes of lightning and rumbles and peals of thunder. And then before the throne, there's seven lamps. Right? They're blazing. It says these are the seven spirits of God. And then also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. So already in the imagery, there's this incredible vividness to it that it's almost like John can't capture. There isn't anything good enough or quite right to describe it. But we would have heard in those images all kinds of echoes. The one on the throne. Spoiler, it's God the Father. It's God, right? And those 24 elders and 24 thrones, one of the thoughts is that it echoes the first chronicles um, capture of 24 priestly orders. And this interpretation has some weight because what we see those 24 elders doing is the priestly duties, right? They're bringing the prayers, they're ushering in the worship. So we have this kind of heavenly priesthood. And the seven lamps, the text tells us, are the seven spirits. The complete spirit, the Holy Spirit, is in the picture And all of these images, the rainbow, right? When you think rainbow, we should think, or if you're a reader, we think Noah. We think the promise to Noah, right? And when we see lightning and hear thunder, these people would have thought Mount Sinai, Moses, an encounter with God. And even something like the sea would have had a a kind of a Genesis connotation as God separated the, the waters on the earth And in the heavens, all these echoes. And if you keep going, now we have some more characters. Now these are really, would be fascinating to draw, right? We have the four living creatures. And the text tells us all these interesting details. They're covered in eyes, right? I mean, this is like, this, you you couldn't get something more vivid. I mean, Marvel would be jealous of the kind of imagery and imagination, right, that is stoked in these visuals. And they're all diverse. And they echo these creatures in other scenes, the seraphim in Isaiah's vision, the Ezekiel throne room scene that Mike referenced. And they would have actually, the four of them, would have brought to mind the four cherubim that were on the edges of the Ark of the Covenant where the very presence of God dwelt. The four creatures. And it says day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy 
is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And in all this vivid imagery, these 24 elders and the four living creatures, what we see there is the demonstration of kind of the full capture of the universe, of all creation, animal, human, angelic, right? We see a full capture. And what they're doing is demonstrating the appropriate response to the one who captures our attention in the center of this scene. They worship. They never stop worshiping. That is the response we're invited to consider. Will we be part of that? Will we join in the ever-widening circle of worship? Let's keep going to Revelation 5, because after that initial dramatic scene is revealed, something happens in Revelation 5. And John engages again, and he sees something new. Do you remember what he sees? It says, it, he sees in the right hand of him who's on the throne a scroll. And the scroll has writing on both sides, and it says the scroll is sealed it's a little visual to help imagine, sealed with seven seals, completely sealed. And it says, I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy? Who? Who is worthy to break the seals and open this scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy. So what started as this incredible scene of exaltation and worship now has this dramatic tension. There is a scroll. It's in the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. It's clearly important, and no one can seem to open it. But why is John so grieved? Why? It's interesting, right, that there's a mystery, like, what is on this scroll? What does it say? What is its purpose? Why is it so important? And I want to say, as we're going to continue through Revelation, you start to see the impacts of this scroll opened. And scrolls were typically one of two things at this time in history. A scroll was typically either some kind of historical account, like a record of some kind, um, or it was a legal document, especially sealed ones. It would have been some kind of legal document, um, contract, contractual piece. And it's interesting to think that in some ways the mystery, we're like, this, this, is it the scroll of all of human history that might unfold? And where is it going? Is it the culmination of the covenant, of the contract between God and all creation? Something begs to be opened and known. And as you watch Revelation unfold, I'm going to tell you some of the things that we're going to see in the coming next 15 to 20 chapters that help us understand why it's so critical that this scroll be opened. Because if the scroll is not open, we see in 5.9, this chapter, Jesus would not be worshipped as worthy to open the scroll. Jesus would not be worshipped as the world's redeemer. In chapter 6, the martyrs would not be avenged and vindicated. In chapter 8, the prayers of the saints, not answered. In chapter 9, God's appointed plan would not come to pass. 11, the kingdom of this world would not become the kingdom of our Lord and of our Christ. The wicked would not be judged. Demonic hordes not overcome. King Jesus would not come back. God would not reign in glory in the new heavens and new earth. In short, if the scroll is not opened, the Bible's promises don't come to pass. Hope is defeated and evil wins. Everything's at stake. Can you understand John's desperation? Right. Who is worthy? Who? 
But then it says that an elder speaks up and says to John, don't, don't weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And again, so the voice says it's the lion, and it then says, John turns and he sees what? A lamb standing in the center of that throne, encircled by the creatures and the elders. And we've talked some about this, but I want to remind us the importance of that and even the symbolism in expecting the lion and seeing the lamb, right? Because that should track with their messianic confusion, if you will, over the millennia, right? This was a people who expected the one who would come back to redeem the world, the Messiah, to be the lion, to come like a lion. And instead, Jesus came and secured victory through the shedding of his blood, through the giving of his life. The lion and the lamb. And of course, this lamb would have had the Passover imagery that they knew of, right? From their story of their people. And just as the Passover lamb, the slain lamb, the blood that was shed over the doorways of the homes... As that secured their first exodus and liberation as a people out of Egypt, out of bondage. Again, in the Revelation narrative, we see that it is the lamb, the slain lamb, who will secure our final exodus and liberation. Who will unlock all of the mysteries of the human story and history and will bring to its culmination in the final exodus. And as this happens, right? As the lamb takes the scroll, what happens in the heavenlies? Do you see it? It says that the living creatures and the elders, what do they do? It says they fall down before the lamb. They can't even stand in the presence of the one who is so worthy. They fall down and they worship. They worship the lamb. Revelation is a text that calls us to worship. In fact, most of the writers, you read any kind of scholarly study and breakdown of this book and they'll say that the heartbeat of revelation, the revelation to John is that worship is at the center, right? Worship of God is at the center. And the invitation is to ask, what is our worship centered on? Who is our worship centered on? And as these ever-increasing circles of worship erupt, right? First you have the creatures, then the elders. And then it says the armies of angels. Did you hear that? It's like thousands, tens of thousands. The circle keeps getting bigger and bigger. And it's all creation is invited to worship the worthy lamb. We worship God for who he is for his character and nature, his very being. We're a people who worship God for what he has done and what he will do. And Revelation reminds us that we worship a God who will triumph, judging and defeating evil. The scroll is opened. And God will bring about a final liberation. And so as we close, and the worship team can come back up, as you've, I hope you've let yourself imagine this scene a little bit more fully. And it is a fantastical scene, I get that. It's hard to imagine. And even as we sit in the room, um, we're in a different space. It's interesting, we look to the center, but when you look across, like you see a neighbor 
a friend, a teacher. And we're reminded that we do this as a community. And we're exposed to each other, but we share a center. And so I want us to consider today the fact that what you imagine and what we hear in Revelation 4 and 5, this incredible scene of worship, Father, Son, Spirit, is actually, though hard to imagine, it is the most real thing there is. It's the most real. It's more real than anything you can touch or smell or see, or hear, it is the most real thing. And I know that's hard because our day-to-day life demands all of our senses and all of our attention, right? The next assignment due, the friendship that is strained, the job assignment, the sickness we're managing, right? Life just demands all of our sensory attention. But friends, that's not the most real things. Those aren't the most real things. This is the most real thing. And it takes the engagement of our will and imagination and it takes the grace of God to be present to what is most true. And we're going to have a chance to continue to worship and to respond and as we try to fix our gaze to center our hearts and minds on the one who is worthy, the only one worthy, I want to invite you to engage. Will you join? Will you join that ever-expanding worship that is the most real thing? And in this time, as we have a couple of songs, maybe you still have one of those cards that you want to bring to the bowl. People you're praying for, or people have gone before you that you're worshiping with. Maybe you have another prayer and you just want to write a prayer. We have cards up here. You can bring a prayer to the bowl as those rise to God. And as you worship with music, I invite you, maybe you want to kneel as the elders fell down. Maybe you want to sing. Maybe you want to be silent. Maybe your body posture will reflect the reality of your soul responding to the most real thing. So God, would you mercifully draw our gaze to you. Lion of Judah, the worthy lamb who holds all of history, who is the most real thing. Would you draw out our worship? Would it rise to you as an honor and praise?